you look at analog industries, you know, you typically end up with about 50% of the businesses consolidated part of bigger practices. If you look at, you know, ophthalmology or dentistry or vet, or there's a lot of analogs. You can look at dermatology. Right. So if you believe you're going to get to about 50% consolidation, there's call it roughly, I mean, you can debate the math. There's probably 14, 15,000 practices of any substantial scale, probably eight to 10,000 kind of med spas or uh, other practices that aren't kind of, you know, that would be really eligible. Uh -huh. So if you get to 50%, that probably means four to 5,000 practices are going to be part of one of these larger groups, either, okay. you know, they're building national brands, they're doing franchises, they're doing what we're doing. So if you believe that the case, you're probably going to have 10 to 15 companies that eventually own four to 500 locations each would be my guess. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Drew Fine, the Chief Commercial Officer of AMP. Thanks for coming, Drew. Great to be here, Grant. I've always wanted to join the show, and I'm glad it worked out. I'm so happy that you could come and join me today. Now, you come from Texas, so thanks for coming all the way out here. And uh, But I want to go back in time before we get to AMP. First of all, what does AMP stand for? Yeah, so AMP is Advanced Metastatic Partners. So we're a new company uh, that is participating in some of the consolidation and changes going on in the aesthetic industry. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little yeah, bit. We'll but yeah, we that. talk about AMP And all that's time. metastatic, not metastatic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely metastatic. Medical aesthetic. Yes, right. Okay, but let's go back in time. Yeah. Where'd you grow up? Uh, so I grew up Midwest, Chicago, Milwaukee, um, you know, lived there from uh, when I was real little until graduated high school. So I'm a Midwestern guy at heart. Uh, cool. Well, I lived seven years in St. Louis. I think I get a little Midwestern stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So then where'd you go to college? So I uh, went to college, undergrad at Duke University. So I had a really good basketball team to root for, which was, which was really fun. Uh, and then after Duke, I, uh, I ended up doing consulting for a couple of years. So I worked in really sexy things like aluminum and uh, <laughs> annuities and health insurance, uh, and then ended up back at the University of Michigan for business school. So I, I used to joke that I had a good basketball team to root for, so this gives me a good football team to root for, too. So, okay. How many years did you work before you went back to uh, Michigan? Uh, just two. Two. Yeah. And then did you get your MBA? Yeah, I got my MBA from Michigan. Okay. And then what was your next stop? And then uh, coming out of Michigan, I started with a company called Eli Lilly and Company. Uh -huh. So Lilly at the time and still one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, uh, really known for their leadership development training programs. Okay. So they had a great kind of early career leadership development program that I jumped into. So. I was at Lilly for about 10 years, uh, did all diabetes, uh, sales, marketing, strategy jobs, uh, bounced around the country quite a bit. So lived in Indianapolis, Kansas City, lived down in San Diego for a couple of years, working with one of our biotech partners, lived in Texas for a couple of years as a sales manager, moved back to Indianapolis and uh, had a pretty, pretty great 10 year run at Eli Lilly. It sounds like it. And then from there, did you go to Galderma? Yeah, so that's about, from there I went to Galderma. Um, so the funny story is, um, Alyssa Lask, who I know you know, sure. Uh, she she actually hired me out of business school into Lilly, and then wait, she, wait, wait, let me. Yeah. So Alyssa hired you out of business school. Oh, to Eli Lilly. Yeah. And then subsequently and, hired you again in yeah. Galderma? So in 2004, she that. hired me. Yeah, well, good question on her part, right? <laughs> but uh, no, she was a friend and mentor and colleague. And so she took this job at Galderma in 2014. And she called me up and was like, hey, I just took this new job. I'm like, oh, that sounds really exciting. You know, we really loved Texas when we were there. Uh -huh. And I jokingly told her, hey, if you ever have a job, let me know. I'd be, I'd be interested. She literally called back two weeks later and said, we just did this big business development deal. I've got a pretty interesting opportunity if you want to look at it. So uh, I didn't know anything about aesthetics at the time. Um, so called my mom, said, uh, <laughs> mom, I'm talking to this company, the aesthetics, something about similar to Botox. And she's like, oh my gosh. So uh, in 10 years at Lilly, diabetes, I think I talked to my mom about my job maybe five minutes total. Right. I had a 50 minute conversation with her all about <laughs> aesthetics, about her loyalty program, what she gets done. All this sort of stuff. I was like, well, this sounds like it could be a pretty interesting opportunity if it works out. So uh, jumped back, jumped to jumped to Galderma in 2014, right when they had bought the business from Valiant. Right, and and you moved to Texas. You moved back to Texas, and you reported to Alyssa. I reported to Alyssa, who's been on this program and yeah. is a dear friend. Yep. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so was it uh, Galderma there when we kind of 
had a whole bunch of activity. I think that's when we first met. Back yes, I think, it is. I want to say December 2014, I was racking my brain at looking at some old pictures. I showed up at your office when you had the man cave, and uh-huh. we were getting ready to launch a new product that called Wrestling Silk at the time. Yes. And I was talking to you about it and getting some advice on it and working with your you know practitioners about what we we're going to do to launch that thing. And then so, how long were you with uh, Gal Derma? So I was with Gal Derma for seven years. So in that seven-year period, had a pretty great run. What was uh, your title when you left Galderma? Yeah, so I was the vice president for marketing for the U.S. aesthetics business when I left. So uh, we kind of went from, bought the business from Valiant and grew it pretty substantially. I think we tripled the business in seven years, launched uh, 10 FDA uh, new products and indications, which was a, a pretty epic run. Um, hired some wonderful people, built a great culture. Um, saw a lot of ownership changes. You know, we were owned by... Nestle, and then Nestle sold to EQT, so it was owned by EQT for a little bit of time. Um, but uh, yeah, I had a great time at Galderma, loved the people there, uh, loved what we were able to build, um, and uh, had a really really fun time while we were there. And from there, you went to Allegan. Yeah, so similar story, another kind of mentor of mine from my Lily days, a lady named Adria Simmons, had uh, called me up and said, hey, we've got kind of an interesting opportunity Wait, if you look you for Wait, you worked with Idris also? Yeah. Yeah. So every She's every move, my, too. Every move in my career friend. has been someone who I've known who's kind of said, hey, I have an opportunity I think you'd be interested in. Um, so I joke, someone's like, well, when did you apply for a job? I'm like, I don't think I've ever actually applied for a job. <laughs> uh, they've all been, hey, we think it, th- this might be the right time for you to consider it um, with some people that I've really loved to to work with. And, you know, I've known Carrie in the industry and some of the other Allergan people. And so at the time, it was a really interesting opportunity. If you had had time at Galderma and then time at Allergan, if you love aesthetics, it felt like a, a pretty nice combination for me from a development standpoint. And what was your title in Allergan? So I was the vice president for marketing, marketing for facial marketing. That's uh, right. And then also did some work with kind of the new product development as they were bringing um, new R&D or business development deals to fruition and planning some of the launches for those things. And I work with you when you're at Galderma, and yeah. I work with you when you're at Allegan. I can remember yeah. meeting with Idris and you down in Irvine and others. Yeah. But I didn't know you had worked with her before at Lilly. Yeah. What a small world. So, yeah, she was a, she was a mentor back in the day. Um, and uh, we'd always talked about working together, and this the timing just works out. And now she's back at Abbey in, yeah. in Chicago. Yeah, so she's back at Abbey in Chicago. And, uh, you know, now I'm at kind of at this new AMP thing. And so, well, before we get to that, yeah. so how long were you at Allegan? So I was at Allegan about a year and a half or so. Uh-huh. Uh, and then they went through some changes and uh, ended up where I got a chance to look for some new opportunities. Um, and uh, really excited about where I ended up. And I think they're in a great place, too. They're doing some great things now. Uh-huh. So tell us about AMP. Yeah. So Advanced Metastatic Partners, um, really interesting company. I got introduced to them uh, last fall when I was kind of looking for next roles. Uh And you kind of look around the industry right now, and there's a lot of activity going on with private equity, um, different kinds of investors. Um, It's a large industry, but relatively unconsolidated. Uh, It's a very high-growing industry. It's a very profitable industry. There's a lot of great practices. Uh, but there's a big opportunity to put some of these things together. So it's a company that's participating in the kind of roll-up and consolidation of practices. We like to say we're a little bit different from the traditional private equity model, just with our kind of leadership team, some of the financial backing we have, and the strategy going forward. It's a little different than the traditional private equity role. But yeah, that's essentially what we're doing right now. Um, I think we're the largest multi-brand uh, practice owner uh, in the U.S., What do you mean by multi-brand? Well, so part of our strategy is we like to uh, partner with practices or acquire practices, but we don't change much about them. We don't change the branding or the name or the logo. So the analogy I usually use is for people who are familiar with the Marriott Bonvoy program. Uh There's Westons, and Westons generally look the same, and Marriott's generally look the same. Then they have their autograph collection of hotels. And all those are unique and special in their own local markets. They don't kind of westernize them, but Mm -hmm. they're special there. But on the back end, they have some things to help those practices and those hotels, right? You have a centralized loyalty program, some help with SOPs and marketing and HR and operations and recruiting and all this kind of stuff, booking, et cetera. We kind of do the same thing. So we're trying to build that kind of autograph collection of aesthetics, so to speak. Interesting. Now, do you do just med spa or do you also do surgery? No, we have a a mixture of practices. So we have um, aesthetic dermatology practices. We have plastic surgery practices. We do have a lot of med spas as well. Um, I'd say right now, if I look at the business, we're probably about 20% surgical, about 80% non-surgical. But we really, we want to be participating in aesthetics where aesthetics is growing. 
So I think it's really hard to do that if you're just owning plastic surgery or dermatology or just doctor own practices. I actually think it's very hard to do if you just own you know, med spas, you want to have a good diversified mix of the business. So you have great clinical leaders, uh, great practices, uh, but you're also playing where the patients are going as well. Okay. So are you somewhat agnostic to, uh, to the actual uh, specialty of the, of the doctor? For instance, there's facial plastics, there's plastic surgery, yeah. as you know, there's ocular plastics and there's derm, pla- or there's yeah. med derm aesthetics or aesthetic derm. Yeah. And we call that the core. Yeah. Uh, right. Are you open to the whole core? Yeah, we do have uh, we have practices that are part of the whole core. Uh-huh. Um, so facial, oculo, dermatology and <laughs> traditional plastic surgery, body plastics like yourself. Uh, you do a lot of faces as well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have a whole mixture. Um, OK. And um, yeah, but we think that's good for the business. The nice thing, too, is if you build a large enough company, eventually you'll have some like internal networks that you could, you know, kind of hub and spoke models and refer things to, et cetera. Yeah, uh, that will grow over time. Uh huh. So you're right now you're in an acquisition mode. Are yeah. you going to build any yourself from the ground up type of things? New, new vote? Yeah. New practices? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we started the company back in October. And we've been growing pretty fast through the kind of acquisition and partnership. And I I do say partnership because it's not just a pure acquisition. I mean, that's the functional financial components. But whoever we partner with, they actually become owners in the bigger AMP company. So we do think of all of our practices as partners. Um, We'll start to look at kind of opening new places where it makes sense. Uh Um, That's a different skill set. We have some people on board that will help lead that. So we're definitely dipping our toe in the water there. Um, I know some other companies, that's their primary strategy. I wouldn't say it's our primary strategy right now, but it's a very clear opportunity. We have some great brands who are looking to grow and expand. That it's are hard, part of AMP? That are part of AMP. Okay. It's hard to do that by yourself. Yeah. So we can bring some operational help, some financial help to help them expand. So we certainly have practices that we are looking at new locations with too. And. The finances, uh, where's the money coming from? Is this private equity money? Is this an yeah. individual, a family? What, where's this money coming yeah, from? Yeah, so it's not the traditional private equity. Um, we're working with a company called Leon Healthcare Partners, part of the Leon Capital Group. Uh-huh. So it's a private capital company from a guy based in Dallas. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, so it's not the traditional private equity. It's a little bit different. It allows us to kind of make decisions a little faster. We don't have quite as many of you know committees or quarterly reviews. Lawyers. Well, there's a lot of lawyers involved. There's always a lot of lawyers involved um, to protect us. Yeah. But uh, no, I think you know he's someone. They've had a track record of success in similar types of businesses. Um, they built a large company in the specialty dental space, so they have a great track record of this. They understand kind of what you need to do from a financial operational operational components. Generally, Leon likes to hire really good management teams that know the business. So you look at them and say, wow, this is a great opportunity right now. You know, it's a high growth market, high margins, unconsolidated, cash pay, not a lot of insurance to deal with. That's pretty attractive. Yes. Great. So, okay, let's you know pull a lot of this together. Let's put a management team in place that knows the business. Let's get the right practices on board. Let's invest for the long term. Um, not just like a financial engineering component to it, and you can build a company with a lot of long-term sustainable value. So tell me about the management team uh, here at AMP. Yeah, great question. This was actually one of the things that uh, really made it very appealing for me to join the company. So the CEO is a lady named Nicole Schiermonte. So Nicole has been a serial entrepreneur for 25 years. She had her first exit at 19. She has run practices for about 10 years in aesthetics, kind of MSO model. Uh So she, at her heart, loves running practices. And she has this passion to build a company that's an alternative to the traditional private equity models. But our CEO like has literally run successful practices for 10 years. Our COO just did the same thing in the veterinary space. We built a big multi-location uh, company where you understand all the back end nuances. Our head of legal has been a senior partner at one of the most prestigious law firms and dealing with all the legal compliance issues within metastatics uh, for 10 years as well. And then ostensibly, I know a little bit about marketing and aesthetics too. And we're bringing on more people who really know the business as you kind of build the organization. Organization uh, with experience, kind of building training, education programs, running practices, integrating practices, etc. So, I think we've got a team that has more medical aesthetics knowledge to do what we're trying to do than most of the others that I've looked at. That's great. But yeah, Nicole's a great person. You should meet her at some point in time. I look forward to it. Dynamic female leader. Absolutely. I can't wait to meet her. So uh, maybe you can hook me up with her. Maybe she could be on the program. We'll make it happen for okay, sure. Okay, good. So, what are your plans over the next, say, three to five years? 
Uh, you know, it's a great question. People ask me this all the time, and I say, <laughs> I'm going to go back three years. So three years ago, I was working for Galderma, and we hadn't even completed the EQT deal at the time. Fast forward three years, I'm in a totally different place. I'm with one of the fastest growing and largest like consolidators and practice owners. So what's the next three to five years look like? I don't know, it's really hard to predict. Um, I would say I think aesthetics is a place where you're gonna see a lot of dynamic change. And I think we'll probably be part of that from an AMP standpoint. Will AMP, is AMP pro, uh, gonna go public? Do you think, are they gonna sell to a bigger uh, PE firm? Or what? Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea? You know, the the best thing I say is I kind of look at kind of what the Leon healthcare team did with some of their other businesses. Okay, learning so, from the past. Exactly. And so what did he do? So what, what he did, do? so their specialty dental business, um, what actually happened was instead of like selling to a new owner or going public, um, they like to build for the long run. So they end up selling a minority interest um, to a potential partner to fund the next round of growth. So I could see that something happening very similar with AMP where we continue to grow the company. You get to a point where you need another round of growth equity and you find a minority partner. You could okay. sell a majority interest. You could go public. There's certainly a lot of options here. Um, there's a lot of companies who have been putting money into these kind of practices and the delivery side of aesthetics. So I think there's a lot of options on the table. Um, hard to predict. What we usually tell each other kind of from the company standpoint, and even within the Leon group, is the focus right now is just building a really good company. If you build a really good company, all that stuff will take care of itself, sure. whether it's a minority interest, a majority interest, a full sale, a public sale. You know, there's a lot of options on the table, but it all comes from actually getting great practices on board, helping them grow, and running the business really well. Right. You mentioned that the, the, the doctors or the practices are your partners, mm -hmm. that they actually own part of AMP. Is that yeah, correct? That's correct. They take part of the uh, purchase price, I take it, in equity then? Yes. Do yeah. they have a cash piece of that also? So it's part cash, part equity? I'm not going to ask you how yeah, much, yeah. don't worry. Most of the, so every deal is a little bit different, uh -huh. um, as you know, whenever you start doing deals. Yeah. Um, in our side, you know, we have a lot of flexibility with the the ownership standpoint and how we structure the deals. But generally there's three major components to every deal. Uh, there is a cash upfront component to it. Okay. There is a rollover equity. So you kind of, instead of just owning your practice, you now roll that equity into owning a piece of AMP. So in many respects, you own a small piece of lots of practices. Right, right. Um, and then there's usually um, some extra bonuses or we call them earnouts to make sure that your practice continues to perform uh, when you would partner and sell and become part of uh, the AMP family. So those are the three major components. Sometimes there's a few other components to the deal, but we do like to have all the people we partner with um, have a piece of the bigger company uh -huh. um, because it aligns everyone's interests. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's partly why I was asking what the long-term goal is because as, as the practitioners own part of it, they yeah. probably want to know when their payout is. Or uh, is, is one of the, uh, with especially dentistry, was it flowing cash such that they had cash distributions? Uh, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that one um, off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm just curious. You said you have yeah. another raise of the minority partner. I was curious if they're if they're flowing cash, if the practitioners got some of that. I know you said there's yeah. performance bonuses and they have an initial cash. That equity piece is the piece I'm curious uh, uh, about. The equity piece is, uh, I'm pretty sure the equity piece is really designed so that when we have an event, everyone participates in that event. Okay. Um, versus like more of like a dividend type of structure. Right, um, right. Again, that just aligns everyone's interest on like, are you building a company and creating value the right way? Absolutely. Everybody's rowing the same direction. Exactly. And, yeah, I, I get it. No, it's yeah. fascinating to me. Um, and what are your goals in terms of how many practices uh, ultimately? I know you're growing at a rapid rate, but what what's the top or is yeah, there a top? I, that is another great question. Um, when I started talking to the team uh, like October, November last year, the original plan was to get to 30 in the first year, and we felt that was pretty aggressive. Uh, we hit 30 in the first six months. So we hit our kind of one-year plan in six months. Right. Um, I think based on the interest that we're seeing, we'll probably come close to hitting our three-year goal in a year and a half or so. That is great. So I don't know what the top is. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, though, and if you look at the whole industry, so if you look at analog industries, you know, you typically end up with about 50% of the businesses consolidated part of bigger practices. If you look at, you know, ophthalmology or dentistry or vet, or there's a lot of analogs you can look at dermatology. Right. So if you believe you're going to get to about 50% consolidation, there's call it roughly 
I mean, you can debate the math. There's probably 14, 15,000 practices of any substantial scale, probably eight to 10,000 kind of med spas or uh, other practices that aren't kind of, you know, that would be really eligible. Uh So if you get to 50%, that probably means four to 5,000 practices are going to be part of one of these larger groups, either, you know, they're building national brands, they're doing franchises, they're doing what we're doing. So if you believe that the case, you're probably going to have 10 to 15 companies that eventually own four to 500 locations each would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, there's a number of companies out yeah. there in this space. There's no question about that. Yeah. So, well, it's been great to learn about AMP. Now, I'd like to ask you to pull out your crystal ball. Yeah. We've been talking a little bit about the future, but I want you, you've been in this aesthetic space for so long. You've worked with Galderma. You've worked with Allergan. You're running AMP here. Um, What's the future look like? Three, five, even out ten years you know, in aesthetics. F- is your mom still going to be talking to you for fifty minutes? <laughs> I think so. She, she does nowadays. <laughs> that's for sure. You know, it's also funny because I, you know, I, people joke about aesthetics. I'm like, well, when I was in diabetes, that was products <laughs> that you need, you don't want, and you want someone else to pay for. Mm-hmm. In aesthetics, you don't need them, but you really want them, and you want to pay cash. So. I think what I saw eight years ago is probably still pretty true going forward. Uh, if anything, it's probably getting even more true. Um, I would have answered your question maybe a month or two ago very differently. I think right now what I should probably do is go ask that question to chat GPT, and it'll probably give me an answer. <laughs> um, so I do think AI is going to play a really interesting role um, and change a lot of dynamics going forward. Very hard to predict how, but it's certainly going to play an effect. I think there's two other really interesting trends that I see in aesthetics. So one... Um, we're on the cusp of pretty significant innovation, I think. And aesthetics has always been driven by innovation. There's a lot going on in the regenerative space, kind of working with your body. There's a lot of really interesting technologies that I think in the back half of this decade will really start to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And then I think you're seeing a lot happening within data and technology. uh, And aesthetics is still pretty behind in using data and technology effectively. So the more we can really stitch together data, technology, and new technology, Um, innovations, I think that'll take this whole aesthetic space to very different heights down the road. I would completely agree, and thus the technology of beauty. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, Do you have any thoughts about subscription services? Uh, I I happen to really, I'm very fond of subscription services, and the the one that Patient Fi came out with, uh, um, Privy, is really wonderful. I don't know uh, how much experience you have with it or what the... what you even think about subscription. Yeah, I, I've been looking at this for quite some time in aesthetics. I love the concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, making it work is always a bit of a challenge. If I look across all of our practices, we have some who use subscriptions very successfully. You know, it's a huge driver of their business. They have 30, 40, 45% of their revenue coming through subscriptions. That's a game changer in terms of how you can run your practice, what you can invest in, mm-hmm. um, the consistency of your cash flows. So if you can make it work, I love it. Um, there's a lot of challenges to making it work, which right. is, I think, where people have run into um, issues over time. So it feels like it's changing, though. I think we're on the cusp of being able to deliver things in a way that work for patients and consumers more effectively. And with subscriptions, this is the thing that kind of always surprises me is it's not just about the subscription. It's about creating an experience that works for the people walking into your practice. Mm-hmm. And if it does, then you're going to create a really, really happy customer for a long, long time. And if you can get your technology, your your customer service, your practice experience, all aligned to providing amazing customer experiences, whether it's a subscription or something else, you're gonna have a lot of success. Subscriptions can certainly facilitate that if you do them well. It's interesting though, you do have to change a lot of things to make them work. You gotta change how you train your you know, practice consultants, your people in the office, your sales staff, your injecting or treating staff, uh, to make sure people understand what the benefits are, how you're talking about them, the whole kind of marketing kind of lead generation funnel kind of changes quite a bit when you really wanna implement these well and at scale. The other thing I think you'll see from a um, you know, future you're getting big companies. My company is growing very fast. There's other companies doing the same thing. Um, you're going to have really large players on the delivery side of the business. That changes how you can invest. It changes the technologies you can use. It changes how you roll things out. So I think you're going to see a situation where you have a lot of uh, benefits on that side of thing that people don't fully kind of understand and appreciate. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been an absolute delight to have you here, Drew. 
Um, thanks for coming all the way out from yeah. Texas. I and put on I my best kind of California gear so I can absolutely. feel like I'm on vacation at least. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, and I'm wearing my flip-flops. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Here in beautiful uh, Manhattan Beach, California. I look forward to seeing you at the upcoming meetings. I wish you all the very best with AMP. I can't wait to hear how, how it goes for you. I know you're going to be successful. Well, I appreciate you allowing me to share a little bit of the AMP story. And, you know, like I was telling you earlier, I we have a great leadership team with a lot of aesthetics experience. We've got a great financial backer. we got great partners. Um, and I think we're going to be able to invest in ways with training and education, a few other things that um, other people won't. So I'm pretty pretty bullish on what the future looks like for us. I don't blame you. So once again, we learn about a whole new technology from Drew Fine. He's uh, been our guest today. We've had a wonderful time. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'll see you next week.